So George, you're going to be filling in a lot of the blanks. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. But I will just share a little bit about George from what I've learned from Don and from his bio. Currently, um, George Manaski is the director of the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, and that is in training and proficiency in the nuclear industry. He's also the secretary of the National Academy for Nuclear Training, which governs the accrediting of nuclear training programs in the United States. But before this current position, and this is what uh, George will share today, uh, George was in the United States Navy as a retired, uh, currently Navy commander. Uh, he commanded, He was a commander of a submarine squadron as well as a commander of a nuclear submarine. And when Donna had originally spoken to me about George, one of the things that she mentioned was just being Jewish in this position brought its own challenges. And the the amount of times that you have to move and and celebrate holidays where you're not given enough time to prepare properly. Uh, those were just some of the challenges and the things that George rose to the challenge. So I'm very honored to introduce George Manaski today, who's going to share his story. You'll probably have other questions that he might not address. So that is an opportune time after his presentation uh, to ask your own questions. So without any further introduction, uh, I, I present to you, George, the retired U.S. Navy commander. Well, thanks very much, Rabbi. It's great to be here with this group today. Uh, let me try to share my screen right off the bat. We, we practice this a little bit. Um, of course, now it's a little different. Um, now, are, are you still seeing me? Yeah, you are. Okay, I think I need to get out of uh, presentation mode here. Let me do something. You can do that after you um, share your screen. You can still okay. control your PowerPoint. And so May I, I can see you. Thank you yeah. very much for being here. It's my pleasure. Yeah, of course, I've messed something up a little bit. Uh, even though, oh, there we go. That's where I was having a problem. Okay, so now uh, I will share my screen. And I hope I have the right thing up. And... Yes, there we go. Now do you see the uh, presentation? Yes. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, and now let me try to go to presentation mode and see if that works. Now, do you see the uh, presentation full screen? Yeah, we're seeing it with your notes, so. Oh, with my notes, okay, well. We'll, we'll continue like that then. Um, so as we say here in the South, uh, shalom y'all. Um, I'm gonna talk today about 30 years in the submarine force. And uh, when the rabbi mentioned how I've met these challenges, it's really more about how a family meets these challenges uh, through those 30 years. So uh, I'd ask you to just sit back and relax and um, enjoy a couple of sea stories here, because uh, as we say in the Navy, um, this is a real no shitter, uh, which usually means there's a lot of exaggeration involved, but uh, I'll try to keep it on, uh, keep to the truth a little bit. So a little bit of background about submarines in general. There are two different kinds of boats uh, in the nuclear Navy. There are the attack boats, which are the hunter killers who during the uh, Cold War, their main mission was to go out and hunt uh, Russian submarines, primarily. Um, in more modern times, uh, and I'll talk a little more in detail, they do land attack miss uh, missions. You saw that in both uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. The other type of submarine is a strategic ballistic missile submarine. Uh, in the Navy submarine force, we refer to those as boomers for obvious reasons. They, they launch a strategic uh, ballistic missile uh, let's say 5,000 miles uh, downrange uh, with an atomic warhead or multiple atomic warheads on them. So we call those boomers. I had the privilege of serving on both of those kinds of boats. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each as uh, we go through this. Now, um, let's see. Uh, I usually wind up asking some questions here. If everybody heard the, uh, uh, the rabbi's introduction, if you know the answer, raise your hand and I'll ask the rabbi to 
call on someone and unmute the person who, who raises their hand first. Who knows what uh, submarines were named after during World War II? Do we see any hands, Rabbi? No, it's absolute silence. Over oh my here. goodness. I can't believe no one has seen Run Silent, Run Deep or any of those old movies. Donna has her hand raised. Oh, Donna does. Okay. What do you, what do you know, Donna? Hold on. Let's get Donna unmuted. Unmuted. There you go, Donna. I don't know. I'm guessing. Is it presidents? No, they were named after fish. Fish. Oh, I was going to fish. Well. Uh, things gonna... like the, the Wahoo, the Skate, the Sculpin. And that continued on in the modern nuclear submarines for quite a while into the 70s. Uh, my boats were named after fish, most of them. Uh, but eventually the Navy figured out something really important and that was that fish don't vote. So they started naming submarines after cities like the Los Angeles, Cincinnati, New York, New Orleans, you name it. Um, and then also after states. Ohio, Michigan, Georgia. These were all named after states. Those were the new uh, Ohio class ballistic missile submarines in the uh, 70s and 80s. Um, so that's the naming uh, uh, convention for submarines. So our journey in submarines and nuclear power started off in Long Island, New York. Uh, people usually say I have absolutely no accent, um, but I can put it on if I have to. Uh, it started off in Long Island, New York, and uh, in 1973, when I applied to the United States Naval Academy, and at that time, in my, uh, my Navy biography used to say, um, I would eventually married my high school sweetheart, Susan Fader. Um, at that time, and now, as it continues today, in order to go to the Naval Academy, you needed a nomination from either a senator or a congressman. And each senator and congressman is allowed to have a certain number, I believe it's four uh, midshipmen, as we call them at the Naval Academy, in at any given time. And I was lucky enough to get nominated by Senator Jacob Javits, who uh, his name comes up on the news now. If you're following COVID-19 in New York, uh, they turned the Javits Center uh, into a hospital. And that uh, journey continued for from 1973, more than 30 years and ended in Pearl Harbor in 2006. Uh, and Susan and I did get married right out of the Naval Academy. Uh, and uh, we moved 20 plus times, 20 plus times in 30 years. And that included probably 10 to 12 different synagogues for some, because some of those moves were in and out of places we had previously been, because there were only so many submarine ports, home ports around the country. It also included 15 different jobs uh, in the Navy. So that was one of the things that I particularly liked about it. Uh, you were always moving up in, uh, in the Navy, in, in rank and in the, the scope of responsibility. And I'm gonna turn on my clock over here so I can keep on time for you. Um, we lived in about 10 different states during that time, and, and Susan always found a place to belong. Uh, our daughter went to uh, Solomon Schechter Academy for kindergarten up in Groton, Connecticut, uh, and uh, she studied for her bat mitzvah in Newport, Rhode Island, and then was ultimately bat mitzvah in, in Merrick, New York, at the Merrick Jewish Center in the same place that Susan had been bat mitzvah. Um, in contrast, there were times when we didn't always find what we needed, and one of those, I, I said that Bonnie went to kindergarten at Solomon Schechter. Our son, Michael, uh, he had the honor of going to kindergarten at the Newport County Catholic Regional School. Uh, luckily, the nuns were very understanding and uh, they uh, pulled him out of any uh, religious studies there. So that was the beginning of our career. Now, um, I'll try to ask another question here and see if it goes over better. Who is the most famous submariner that you know of? And he also holds the record for the longest serving naval officer in history. Anybody know who that is? I see that uh, Ethel Spivak, did you have an answer? I see also uh, 
Let's get it. Ethel, did you have an answer? I don't know. Is it Rickenbacker? Oh, that's so close. I've got another one, uh, Zinder. That was my choice. Oh, that it, was your choice as well. It's close. It's Admiral Hyman G. Rickover. 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 Yeah, Rickover. Rickover. He, was, he was the father of the nuclear Navy. That's uh, right. A Jewish, Jewish man from Poland, an immigrant. Uh, he also went to the Naval Academy a little bit before me, like in like 1919. Uh, and he served in World War I and World War II. Uh, but Admiral Rickover, arguably not only the father of the nuclear nuclear navy, but had a lot to do with civilian nuclear power over the years, because many of the people who ran the civilian nuclear power plants in the early days were folks who had gotten out of the navy and went to work for these nuclear companies in the United States. Now everybody's got a Rickover story. Um, I'm sure you've heard heard about some of them. I'll tell you mine, uh, it's uh, actually kind of pleasant. Uh, everybody who went into nuclear power had to get interviewed by Admiral Rickover right at the beginning. So while I was at the Naval Academy, they took us all uh, in a bus down to Washington DC to his uh, office down there. We had to take a, a written exam. Then we had to take three oral interviews and pass those. And finally we sat around and waited to go get introduced to the great man himself. And uh, the story is uh, you go in, you don't stop. They brief you before you go in, sit down on the chair. And yes, the chair did have a tilt forward. The, the front legs were, were lower than the rear legs. And he would start asking you questions. Now, in my case, he, he asked me some simple questions and I was prepared for them. It's where are you going to stand in your class at the end of your senior year? What's your grade point average gonna be? and how much are you study, gonna study? So I figured I would under promise and then over deliver. So I told him, uh, you know, I'd have a 3.5 grade point average and stand in the top 100 of my class and study 12 hours a day. Well, of course, I knew that Rickover is never satisfied with the first answer. So he came back and said, you'll study 15 hours a week, you'll get a 3.6 grade point average and you'll stand number 80 or better. So I said, what else do you say to Admiral Rickover? Yes, sir. And I got up and left. And shortly after that, they told me I was accepted to the program. Well, it turns out I would get to see Admiral Rickover a second time. When I was going back uh, to Washington for my chief engineer's exam in 1982, that's when Admiral Rickover was about to retire. So the way that exam goes, it very similar. Um, you have a written exam and then oral exams. And normally you wait all of the candidates. At this point, I'm a big uh, Navy Lieutenant. All of the candidates wait in a big room. And uh, the story goes that they will come in, a Navy commander comes in and announces the people who failed and tells them to leave the room and then they tell everybody else that they passed. Well, I'm sitting there waiting anxiously and the commander comes into the room just as the story goes. And the commander says, Vogel, Smith, Manaski, come with me. And the three of us were pretty crestfallen at that point. So uh, we walk out of the room with the commander and we get in the elevator and I said, well, commander, I guess this means we failed, huh? And he goes, no. Rickover wants to see you guys. He's never done this before. This is the first time this has ever happened. So um, we go up to Rickover's office and with no knowledge of what uh, was gonna happen. And we go in all three of us together. And he says to, to Lieutenant Vogel, Lieutenant Vogel, I, I see that you, well, maybe I should do an accent. Lieutenant Vogel, I see that you majored in history at the Naval Academy. Did that help you in nuclear power? Well, and Vogel knew the answer. You know, you, you hear a lot about Rickover. Um, well, Admiral, uh, it gave me uh, a, a, the, the, the desire to learn and everything I needed to know, I was, I was taught at the nuclear power school and prototype. Okay, Vogel. So I forget what he said to Smith, but uh, he turned to me and uh, he said, uh, Manaski, I see here you kept your promises. When you go back to your ship, 
tell you, Captain, you kept your promises. So I think I was the only person that Rick Over ever said anything nice to in his 50 years as a Naval officer. So I always felt pretty good about that. Now, one of my, my friends and classmates, Joe Walsh, he went into the room and, and at the Naval Academy, on your sleeve, you have your, your rank. Uh, I was a three-striper, a company commander at that time, which was pretty good. My friend Joe, he was a six-striper. He was the deputy commander of the entire brigade of midshipmen. So Joe walks into the room and he doesn't even get to the seat. And Emma Rickover says, whoa, whoa, Mr. Walsh, let me count those stripes. Let's count them together. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wow, you, what, what's that about? You must have a big job. Well, sir, I'm the deputy brigade commander. Well, wh what does that mean? What, what do you do? Well, I'm in charge of morale, sir. Oh, morale. Well, um, maybe you could help me with my secretary because she is a real bitch. And I think this is just the challenge for you. So Rick Over says, Ardvark, come in here. And uh, Rick Over says, okay, Mr. Walsh, go ahead and motivate her. Uh, well, Ardvark, uh, what seems to be the problem? Well, I just can't stand working for him. And uh, Joe says, well, why don't you quit? And at that, Rick Over says, get out of my office. So uh, Joe, of course, went on to be a great submariner. He became an admiral in the submarine force. But I thought that was one of the more fun Rick Over stories that I had. So uh, after that period and going through a series of a bunch of training, I finally went to my first boat. And as you can see, hopefully the caption here, it says, oy vey, what did I get myself into? The USS Tullaby uh, SSN 597. We always said it was a fine fighting fish. Uh, it, it turns out it looks more like a flounder uh, from the Atlantic Ocean, the Tullaby. One of the interesting things about this ship was that not only was it one of the oldest ships at the time, but it was a one of a kind. It had a electric drive. And the idea that it was supposed to be super silent so the Russians could never find it. Well, it turned out that it was pretty silent, but it was also super slow. We used to call it a slow attack submarine instead of a fast attack submarine. And if you look closely at the picture, you can see that there's that flat part on the stern. It, it, that's a lot like what a ballistic missile submarine looks like. So the story has it that one time the Russians tracked the Tullaby all up and down the East Coast because they thought it was a missile submarine. So I learned a lot on the Tullaby. Uh, if anybody has ever been on a Disney cruise out of Port Canaveral, Florida, um, there are the, there's a submarine or a base there that was used for testing the missile submarines. And we were coming out of that um, harbor and the captain in the XO decided that we should turn into the, uh, the Trident Basin, as, it, as it's called, which is to the left if you're coming out of the port on your Disney cruise. Beach called Jetty Park, very close. Well, when we made our left turn, we went solid aground on a sandbar there. And all of the people on the beach got to come over and point and watch us try to get out. Um, so the mistake was make sure you have the right knowledge of how your ship handles and also use tugs. Uh, I was standing right on the wings there. We call those the fair water, fair water planes when this happened. And I got a little bit wet from us trying to, to get out. So that was uh, the Tullaby. Um, my second boat was the USS Lafayette where I was uh, the chief engineer. Now it says here, let's get lost. Uh, the, the saying for, uh, those on these missile boats was hide with pride. Because the idea was literally to go out in the case of the Lafayette into the North Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and we would make our patrols out of Holy Lock and get lost and hide from everybody. Even the US uh, command didn't know exactly where we were. And uh, so we were hiding with pride and we were ready to launch our missiles at any time. This is what the missiles look like, the business end of a missile submarine. 
In the case of my boat back in the, uh, in the 80s, those missiles went a bit over 3,000 miles. Now the new Trident missiles go well over 5,000 miles, so they can hit anywhere, anywhere on the Earth. Um, kind of a, a, a little bit of interest here. If you've seen the movie Hunt for Red October, uh, Denzel Washington has to figure out whether or not they, they should launch their missiles. I just want to assure you, I was part of what was called the Emergency Action Message Team, EAM team. We had a lot of training and there's very specific rules on how to piece together different messages and determine whether or not you have a valid launch order. Denzel Washington didn't need to go through all the trouble he went through to, to, to figure that stuff out. So uh, sometimes the movies are pretty accurate, sometimes not. And that was one of the times when it wasn't. It wasn't all hard work. Um, there's a, a spot down in off the Bahamas called uh, Andros Island in the Bahamas. Uh, there's a, a submarine testing area down there called the Tongue of the Ocean. And we would take our submarines, and they still do, take the submarines down there and get to shoot torpedoes uh, at each other, uh, exercise torpedoes. They don't blow up. And usually at the end of that, you can surface and have swim call. So this is swim call in Andros Island on the Lafayette. And you can see the pasty white uh, submarine guys who've been underwater for 60 or 70 days jumping off the, the wings, the fairwater planes, into the water. So after the uh, Lafayette, uh, finally, I got to one of those ships that was named after a city, a more modern boat, the USS Cincinnati, as the executive officer. Uh, a couple little, little bit about the, how, what these type of boats do. I, talked a little bit about up front. These were the Mark 48 torpedoes. They're still in use today. They're called advanced capability ADCAP torpedoes now. They've been modified extensively, but these things have been in the U.S. Uh, submarine inventory for about 40 or 50 years now and still super capable. They can go about 20 miles and they have a fiber optic cable that attaches and runs that whole 20 miles attached to the ship so you can steer the torpedo after the enemy when uh, the boat uh, tries to evade you. So really capable um, action here. This is the uh, business end of a Tomahawk missile. Uh, the fast attack submarines uh, launch the Tomahawk missiles. Uh, as I said earlier, in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, the uh, submarines launch these missiles. They can travel up to 1,500 miles at uh, 500 miles an hour. And they have a very advanced guidance system that literally, and you've seen this in the, in the videos on CNN, can, can fly through a specific window in a building, quite destructive. Um, most of the, the operations I did on the Cincinnati were in the North Atlantic during the Cold War. And uh, I'd have to wait 75 years to tell you about those specifically or I'd have to kill you if I told you about it. So I'm not gonna do either of those things today. So don't worry about that. So finally, uh, I got to be the captain of a submarine, the USS Burgall in about 1983. Um, this was out of Norfolk, Virginia. And um, what we always said as the captain of a boat is it's nice to be king. Because when you're on a submarine, you go out to sea and you don't, send any messages out, you get messages in, but you're on your own and the captain is the law and the captain is the king. Um, so it was uh, pretty nice to, to uh, be on a submarine and, and be the king. Now a little bit about ceremonies in the Navy. Uh, you can see on the, on the stern of the ship there, there's that little white uh, hut looking thing. And that was to prepare for a ceremony on the ship, a change of command or a, in this case, the decommissioning of the boat ultimately in uh, 1996. One of the things that's always a part of that is a benediction. Uh, and Rabbi, you're uh, the chaplain for the police force there. Um, there's always a Navy chaplain. And in up through most of my career, that benediction always had a very Christian bent to it. And I had an opportunity now that I was captain here to change that a little bit so whenever I had a ceremony, I would have Rabbi Amy Perlin uh, give the benediction and preside over the, the ceremony. And Ab Ab Rabbi Amy um, has been uh, part of our family 
uh, since uh, high school years back in, in Long Island. So uh, she managed, she presided over the decommission of the Burgal in 1995. So a little bit more about the Burgal and then I'll come back to that. So uh, one of the other things that's nice about being captain is you get to have uh, guests on board. And this is uh, from right to left, uh, my mother-in-law, Sue's mom, Paula Fader, Sue and her aunt, Tariot. And um, they are on board the, uh, the Burgal shortly after that ceremony you saw there standing in front of what's called the, the ballast control panel. And some of you ladies might recognize those classic styles from the 90s on uh, the lazy ladies track suits there. And there's uh, Paula on the scope. Uh, she's getting ready to uh, sink a surface ship, I think, there in Norfolk. Now, here was something that was kind of interesting. Uh, we were about to depart uh, in this picture for a deployment to the Pacific through the Panama Canal uh, to interdict and do surveillance off the coast of South America on drug operations. Uh, one of the things that subs are really great at is being stealthy and uh, doing surveillance of all kinds. Um, what really happened here, though, there's something that's kind of fun to do. And Donna might recognize the handsome guy, the taller guy there. That's her brother, Michael Moskowitz. Um, and we were going to do what's called the Tiger Cruise. So I was going to take a bunch of uh, the, the male relatives at that time of crew members and myself, in this case, Michael and Michael, the little Michael is my son, uh, on this cruise and drop them off in Port Canaveral, uh, Florida, uh, for two nights we would be out. Well, as it turned out, Hurricane Felix was kicking up in the Atlantic at this time. And the weekend before we were gonna sail, uh, I was with our, our family back in Long Island uh, with the Fader family. And uh, the phone rings, and my mother-in-law, Paula, answers the phone. And she, her eyes got kind of wide. And she said, George, it's for you. It's somebody named Admiral Emery. And uh, so I picked up the phone. And of course, my first words are, yes, Ab. And he said, well, uh, George, um, you know, the hurricane is out there in the Atlantic. Uh, and we're going to sortie all of the ships from Norfolk. And it's your decision if you wanna take uh, the, the tigers, the dependents on the cruise. And I said, well, you know, we're gonna be under the water, not on top of the water. So let's go and let's do it. So we took uh, dependents out on this cruise and we came up the periscope depth in the middle of the hurricane where it was perfectly calm. Throughout the rest of the journey, even down at 400 feet below the surface, we could feel the waves on the surface from Hurricane Felix. And that's uh, little Michael looking out the periscope at what a hurricane looks like. Now, the best cruise that I ever did was when took the, the Burgal to the Mediterranean for five months in 1995. Um, our favorite port call and every sailor who's ever cruised the Mediterranean will tell you their favorite port call was Haifa, Israel. And um, you'll see, I'll be back there a little later on. Uh, this is our part of the handsome crew, the handsome part of the, the guys to the left. Uh, I'm the, the guy on the right, uh, out in front of the USO in Haifa. And you can see there that it's Rosh Hashanah uh, when we pulled in that year. Uh, the manager of the USO was a, a lady named Gila Gerson, and she had been with the US. USO there for years and really had uh, developed a, a love of uh, the American sailors on the part of the Israelis and it was truly felt um, during our time there. This is, uh, oh, I did, I failed to mention that uh, Sue uh, came to visit in Israel, used that excuse to get over there yet again. Uh, and this is us cutting the ribbon on a, a classroom in, a, in an Israeli school. And uh, here is uh, one of my sailors surrounded by the students uh, who really were excited to, to see us there in, in Haifa. I would tell you another uh, interesting fact about uh, the visit to Haifa. Um, while I was in between, in between every sea tour 
Uh, you usually have a short tour, and mine was to go to the Navy War College up in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, and during that time, one of my collateral duties was to take charge of the incoming international students, which included an Israeli Navy captain named Chaim Gaash, um, who we are friends with to this day. Um, and Chaim was the, the commander of the Navy, uh, Israeli Navy base in Ashdod and later worked for the Israeli CNO. And ultimately after he retired from the Navy, uh, became the mayor of uh, Partisana. I don't know if anybody's ever visited it. It's uh, at, in these days, it was a pretty small town. Now it's a pretty uh, 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 hop in place, I would say. So um, eventually I became the Commodore of uh, Squadron 4 in, uh, in Groton, Connecticut. And once again, Rabbi Pearl and Amy uh, presided over that change of command. Uh, I would tell you a little bit more about uh, the Burgal during the visit to the Mediterranean. Um, we did uh, do some operations off of Bosnia. That was during the Bosnia War, uh, where we were in shallow water um, doing surveillance where the, if we stood the boat on end, the, the front third of the boat would have been out of the water. And uh, one night um, as the sun was coming up, I was asleep in my uh, stateroom, which was right next to the control room where the officer of the deck is driving the ship around with uh, his, uh, his crew there. And I have a, a little closed circuit television that I am seeing exactly what the officer of the deck is seeing looking out of that periscope. I suddenly notice every time he goes around by the stern of the ship, I see what looks like a Clorox bottle floating and following the ship around. So I buzz the command or the uh, officer of the deck. Yes, Captain. Uh, hey, Mr. Bills, it looks like there's a Clorox bottle is uh, in trail. What's going on here? So we eventually figured out that not only was there a Clorox bottle there, but there was about a six foot fish attached to the fisherman's line that had been attached to that Clorox bottle. Um, so we had to go out to deeper water and do some maneuvers to free the, the fish off the periscope. So that's one of those sea stories. So you can take that for exactly what it's worth. Um, I would also want to tell you relative to uh, Israel, where it said, I'll be back. Uh, I did come back uh, when I was the chief of staff for command and control warfare in the George Washington battle group. Um, that I was stationed on an aircraft carrier. Uh, we went to through the Suez Canal, through the Arabian Gulf, when Saddam Hussein had kicked the weapons inspectors out. Uh, we mustered at that time, the US mustered three aircraft carriers in the Arabian Gulf, the George Washington, the Nimitz and the John F. Kennedy. Um, the interesting part about that is once we came back out of the Suez Canal and into the Mediterranean, we did an ice port call in Haifa. This time, not only did Sue come over to visit, but her parents, uh, Paula and Harvey did as well. And they got to meet the commander of the battle group, who Admiral Mike Mullen, and hopefully some of you recognize Admiral Mullen's name. He was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under President Obama for four years and was a potential running mate for Hillary Clinton uh, in the 2016 election. So um, that was my second visit to Haifa as a naval officer. Well, things uh, come around and, uh, and the rabbi mentioned he had seen this picture online. Um, that's uh, our son, Michael and me and Susan. And I would point out that Sue is really not that tall. She's actually standing on a step up on the Bema. Um, and this was at uh, Michael's wedding in Temple Israel in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, Michael is now serving uh, as a Lieutenant Commander in the Navy on the USS Harry S. Truman, which some of you might've heard on CNN and the news over the last few weeks, they're being held out at sea because they don't have coronavirus and uh, the country needs to have a ready aircraft carrier until the, the um, carriers that do have cases of the coronavirus are ready to go to sea and uh, are beyond that. Um, 
So let me just go to this slide. So what's going on now? Um, as the rabbi mentioned, I am still involved in nuclear power. And, and this is uh, something you all recognize. It's a nuclear power plant. And um, I have training for the US nuclear fleet, which encompasses about 60 uh, stations, uh, nearly 100 reactors around the US. And with that, oh, there was one other thing I wanted to point out. Just before I went to my second career, I, wa I was stationed and was the chief of staff of the Pacific Submarine Force in Pearl Harbor. And the interesting Jewish connection there is that the, the Pearl Harbor Naval Base is the only base we've ever served at that had a dedicated Jewish chapel, the Shalom Chapel and a dedicated Jewish chaplain, a lieutenant, a rabbi. So, um, you know, that was a, a nice place to end our uh, Navy career um, with its uh, small connection um, back to our Jewish roots. So with that, let me open it up to questions and, and uh, I'll come out of the, um, the share mode so I can see the, your faces and the hands better. And get into that view. So, I have a statement rather than a question. Sure. The statement is that uh, a lot of us have histories, and my history is it was for Westinghouse, and I was at Bettis designing the engines that you used. <laughs> and uh, in 1957, I met a fellow called Admiral Rickover at Argonne National Laboratory at the, at the uh, experimental boiling water reactor where I was working at the time and learning how to be a boy. And uh, I met him 60 feet above ground in the, in the dome of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, containment of, of the EBWR. And he actually climbed a ladder 60 feet up into the air to come and see what was happening up there. That's the kind of guy he was. He was nuts. And uh, the two guys that were working for me at the time were both ex-Navy guys. I wasn't. I was ex-Army. Okay. And uh, they saluted when they saw this guy, this, this skinny guy, this old guy come up uh, through, through a hole in, in concrete way up in, you know, 60 feet above the ground. And the thing, thing that brought us up there was an extension ladder. And the extension ladder was backwards. So it meant that you went up once uh, and then you went out instead of in. I don't know if you've ever seen an extension ladder. Usually the upper extension is further away from you. Right. So it's easier for you to climb up that way. But when you climb up an extension ladder where the front part is the top part, you have to sort of go out and 30 feet above the ground, guy who was like I was afraid of afraid of heights <laughs> has to lean out and get on a, a different ladder and climb up the last 30 feet into a, a, a hole in the concrete up at the top and so on and uh, this guy went up by himself an old guy older than I I was a whole 26 years old and uh, he came up there and and these guys snapped to a salute I didn't know who the hell he was. He was wearing a uniform. And I found out he was Admiral Rickover. And uh, as you know, he was a very square, snotty guy. And it was very clear that's what he was, Admiral Rickover. Yeah. And, uh, so I was- Herb, left with Herb Admiral... I'm gonna jump in because I know there's a lot of questions. Are you asking a question or you wanted to share more I'm stories just, afterwards? I'm just telling a story which is very funny. And uh, unfortunately, I know something about nuclear energy because I was involved in it from 56 to 96. So uh, see you sometime later on somewhere in the world. Take care. Thank Absolutely. you. Herb. Nuclear is a small world. You get to know everybody. Um, George, before you take more questions live through uh, people asking, there are a couple through chat. And if anyone does have a question, uh, best way to start is through chat. If you're having an issue with the chat part, uh, we can then, of course, have you unmute your microphone. Um, but just to start off, you have a couple in the chat. 
Um, and if you want, I can read them to you, whatever's easiest for you. Uh, no, I see them now, Rabbi. So uh, I'll take uh, this one from Izzy. It's about um, what it's like to navigate under the polar cap and how do you see under, under the ice cap. Um, so I personally have never been under there, but when I was the chief of staff out at Subpack, um, our boats would go up under the ice pack. And we have a, had a, and still have, a special organization based in San Diego where there's, there's not much um, ice, but uh, these guys, and they're called ice pilots and they're well-trained. They've done many missions. Um, submarines that go under the ice, first of all, uh, you saw where the wings were on the sub and the thing in the middle is called the sail. The top of the sail has to be reinforced. So there are only certain submarines that can go do that. There is also upward looking sonar uh, that can measure the distance between the boat and the ice. Uh, and in certain situations where the ice is not that much, not that thick, you can actually see the sun coming through the ice through the periscope. Um, so the big thing obviously is to avoid the, uh, the, uh, the icebergs because literally they, in their, some places getting up to the pole, um, the, the distance between the, uh, the, the floor of the ocean and the lowest of those ice keels can be only, you know, 150 feet or so. So similar to when I described operating in shallow water, it's like operating in shallow water. If the boat uh, puts too much of an angle on, it's going to hit the ice or it, the stern, the propeller, could hit the, uh, the floor of the ocean. So um, the, the, what they do up there is use inertial navigation. Um, now the inertial navigation on submarines is extremely accurate when they're under the ice. And they also navigate by the contour of the bottom. Um, the, the bottom sounding devices on the submarines is extremely accurate. So the boats that have gone up there before keep all of those charts of the contour of the bottom of the ocean. And that helps the, the, the boats that follow do what we call bottom contour navigation along with the, the, uh, the, the uh, SINs, the inertial navigation is what it's called. Um, so hopefully that uh, answers, answers that. The other thing they're looking for is when they do surface through the ice and you see all of those popular photographs. I have one of one of my boats, the, uh, the USS Connecticut that surfaced at the pole and a polar bear came out and was trying to eat the stern planes, the fin that sticks up in the back. So that made a pretty nice picture. So let's see what we get. Um, oh, our missile launched from above or below the surface. They're, they're launched from below the surface. And the way it works is the missile comes out, if we're talking about a strategic missile, the missile comes out and it's in a bubble when it first comes out of the, the uh, missile tube. And it doesn't actually light off until it's out of the tube, still in that bubble, then it, it uh, you know, it proceeds. That's why you sort of see, if you see a, if you look at a video on YouTube or something, it looks like the missile comes up and just stops just above the water and then takes off. And that's how that happens. Uh, oh boy, that, I'm gonna skip the next one for a minute. Yeah, the tough ones, don't, don't skip them totally, but, but, I, I won't. Yeah. I'll come back to it. Uh, let's see. Um, what were the real pluses of your career for you and as it impacted your family? I think there are two things I would say. Uh, for the family, one of the things that's interesting is the ability to be adaptable. Um, our kids went through, uh, I would have to say, each of them four or five different schools through the years, lived in, many, lived in many different places and had to learn how to adapt and make new friends. Um, every time we left, there were a lot of tears, I would tell you that. And then the next time there were tears again. And all of those times that if you, if I told you, I told you I had 15 different jobs, that meant um, if you do the math over a 30 year career, we only lived in every place for at most two years. Um, so a lot of uh, ingrained adaptability in the kids. And as I alluded to from a career perspective, it was always nice to, to always have increasing responsibility um, 
in in the career. And actually, uh, I know uh, the rabbi said uh, I was a retired commander, actually retired captain um, uh, through my career and had some really great jobs uh, culminating there as the chief of staff of the Pacific Submarine Force, uh, the second in command of an organization of 10,000 people. Um, so let's see. Sorry about that. I, I guess I lowered your status. And I brought it right back up. So hey, <laughs> no worries there. Um, let's see. A, as a one term, oh, Navy vet, all right. I don't remember what we called subs. Uh, boats is right. So yeah, so submarines are referred to as boats. Other surface ships actually, in a, and this is uh, 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 Mr. Kimmel, uh, who served in the Navy. Um, what we refer to the other boats, uh, the other ships, we call them targets is what the other ships are called. Okay, but uh, if you call a surface ship a boat to the people on it, to the captain of a destroyer, let's say, that's an insult. But for submarines, that's what we are. We're boats. Let's before, see. You, before you touch the anti-Semitism one, do you mind jumping in on, first of all, how often did you find Jewish sailors, if, if we call our Navy, Navy uh, sailors, and why did you choose the Navy? So that, that's a great question. So very infrequently. So I mentioned Admiral Rickover. Um, I probably have run into a total of 10 or 12 Navy submarine officers, um, some notable ones. Uh, um, uh, Eric Ozer, who became an admiral, was the head of the defense research um, uh, organization. Uh, uh, Bernie Cowderer, who was the commander of the Atlantic Submarine Force at one point, but very infrequently. Uh, and interestingly enough, my son Mike, who is on the Truman, uh, he now refers to himself as Jewish Mike. Uh, he, he found like two other Jews on the, uh, on the crew of about 5,000. I'm sure there are more, um, but um, if I could be, you know, frank, uh, very rare do people, um, you know, we, usually we say, um, you know, at the, in the wardroom, which is where all the, the officers eat, you don't want to talk about religion, politics, or sex. But most of the time, that third one was broken. I okay. have a story to add. Yeah. We. This is Sue Manaski. Oh. <laughs> we had a. Uh, we had very close friends named Mark and Suzanne Goldberg, who was also a mentor, and uh, we were. We would celebrate holidays with them, and in fact, I remember um, very, very clearly when we had our first. Uh, celebration. It was a Thanksgiving holiday, and we sat around a table with uh, maybe 20 people um, that we didn't know, and uh, we've always been very sensitive to um, all of the praying that goes on before ceremonies, and and just stay silent because we know what's coming. But this was um, now at the Goldberg house, and Mark Goldberg at the start of dinner said, let us pray. And I nearly lost my breath. And then he said, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam HaMotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. And I started crying because that was the first time that a naval officer prayed my prayer. And it was, it was really quite a moment. I think that's a great memory, Sue. I'm glad you, you remember that. And by the way, she's not down in Florida right now. She's right downstairs. Uh, yeah, so uh, the Goldbergs were with us uh, starting in about 1984 or five. Um, and through the years we went through the Navy, Mark was always about uh, one step ahead of me the, the whole way through. He was Naval Academy class of 73, I think. And I was 77. So, so maybe now you can address the anti-Semitism part within that. Yeah, uh, I would say... Yes, um, not in a way that you know I ever thought that um, someone was holding up my career, but I I'm sure similar to what everybody has experienced in a situation 
um, where someone makes a, a comment that is, um, you know, inappropriate about uh, about uh, Jews. Uh, and this happened uh, on my very first boat. Remember the Oy Bay boat, the Tullaby? Um, I remember very clearly Susan and I, we were bridge players because Sue's parents, Harvey and Paula, were life masters and they got us interested in it. And there was the executive officer. Now, I'm just a young ensign at this point, And, uh, you know, Sue's all of 20 years old. Uh, the executive officer and his wife played bridge. So we're playing bridge with them. And I don't remember exactly what the comment was, but I'm sure Sue does. Uh, but it was definitely something anti-Semitic. And it was difficult to, you know, to deal with that as an ensign to this, you know, this commander who was above me. Gotcha. You got some more questions now. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go back to that really difficult one about what do I think of the captain? Uh, the, did the captain do the right thing in asking for help and reporting the virus aboard the ship? I, I you know, when I first heard about that, everybody has different views of it's, did he do the right thing? Did he not? One of the things that your number one priority is, is your crew and your mission. So I would want to know a lot more facts. And I would tell you that uh, one of the people who commented on it, uh, Bill Murs, Admiral Bill Murs, um, uh, Bill and I worked together in Groton when I was a Commodore in Squadron 4. Uh, I trust his judgment. And he's probably the one who's going to have to do uh, a deeper investigation. What I would want to know is what had the captain already done to uh, to try to fix the situation. Had he gone through the the official Navy channels? There's a an emergency reporting system, and I think uh, his situation would merit using what we call the Op Rep Three system and sending something called a, a Navy Blue. Um, message that would get great a great deal of attention uh, from his chain of command. I don't know if any of that occurred. So uh, if it did, and then he had to go to the, the next level and, and you know, start sending emails, um, I would fully support that. Uh, if he didn't uh, go through those official channels first, I would have a slightly different view. I mean, uh, the, the Navy and the military is built on uh, uh, responsibility and respect for authority. And so, you know, that's my view on it. I would have to know more details to tell you whether I think it was the right thing to do or not. Thank Let's you. Let's see, what else do we got? You had a question about if you ever met Captain Abe Greenberg, who was a Holocaust survivor, became a Navy captain, and retired in Prescott, Arizona. I, I don't think I have ever met him, but I do think I've heard of him, um, you know, over the years. So it's interesting in the submarine force, um, as uh, we were talking about the nuclear industry in general, the submarine force is even a smaller, tighter community. So um, if an officer was an officer within 10 years of either side of my career, I probably know that person, but I don't, I don't think I've ever met Abe. Now, one, one question I don't think you did answer. So what was the reason why you joined the Navy specifically? Yeah, okay. So that was pretty straightforward. Uh, to get a free education. The Navy was offering that, not the Army? Well, oh, you mean over the Army? Oh, you got I mean, like uh, over oh, any okay, other. Okay, compared. So, yeah. Uh, actually, I would tell you this. So um, when I was a high school student, I was a, a very good student. Uh, and our guidance counselor was, and I saw a, a, a article in the, in the uh, Long Island Day, I think that's what the newspaper used to be called. And it was about the, um, it was about, um, it was actually about the Coast Guard Academy. And I took that to my guidance counselor because it said that, you know, the government pays all your expenses and you don't pay for college and they pay you. Why are you going there? I said, hey, this is great. Uh, and she said, "Lo, you know, you don't want the Coast Guard Academy. You want West Point or, or the Naval Academy. And um, the idea, and living on Long Island, it's, it's all about the ocean. So 
the idea of being a ground pounder, as we would call the, the, the West Pointers, uh, it didn't appeal to me as much as, as you know, living on the, on the beach with waves crashing. It turned out that the Navy, it wasn't exactly like that either, uh, but I certainly thought it was a better thing, that better idea than, uh, than uh, going into the Army. Wow. I do have a couple questions actually now. From where are missiles sent to Afghanistan? That was one of them. Um, well, because um, you mentioned that they travel three thousand miles. So, well, the ballistic. So that would be a nuclear tip missile. We, we didn't launch any of those, and ne we've never launched any of those. Um, the Tomahawk land attack missiles can travel uh, about fifteen hundred miles. Um, so um, I, I, I don't want to talk about exactly where they were launched from here. That's another one of those seventy-five year. I'd have to kill you. Uh, questions. So you're saying they? What was the distance that you said those typically can do? Fifteen hundred miles. So it's still from anywhere. Yeah, yeah, pretty far out. Uh, what's What's the difference between the Navy and the Merchant Marine? So in the Navy, uh, you're you're a commissioned officer. Mer Merchant Marine. Um, the, first of all, they don't sail on combat ships. We do have some merchant marine officers who are masters of Navy ships. For example, the USNS Comfort, that got great uh, you know, uh, discussion here during uh, COVID-19 sailing into New York City. The USNS Comfort, it's called a US Naval ship. That is commanded by a master who is a merchant marine officer. I hope that answered the question. And then the last one that you have there is, if everyone knew that Rickover was Jewish. Uh, I think that was more <laughs> oriented towards the, the crowd than to me. I mean, uh, I think, oh, it, the naval officers know that? I, yeah, I think so. I think uh, the submariners uh, knew that. All right, and you have one. I, I, I say we'll take this one as the last question, then if you, okay. if you had a closing thought. Um, Russia supposedly has a hypersonic missile. How does this differ from the U.S. missiles? Uh, well, to be perfectly honest, I, I'm I am not an expert on that. Um, when I was when I retired in 2006, the concept of these hypersonic missiles was just being discussed. Um, I would tell you that the a hypersonic missile is uh, a missile that is you know travels at uh, very very high speed. A Tomahawk cruise missile is only traveling at 500 miles an hour, so it's it's traveling along like a uh, you know an airliner. Um, a ballistic missile is taking advantage of gravity to fall. Uh, to you know, first we push it way up uh, in, in the air, and then it's taking advantage of, of gravity as it goes along. A hypersonic missile um, would cover you know, uh, um, I'm not sure what the range of these things is but a very, would cover distance in extremely short time uh, and not give the target a chance to maneuver. So with that, uh, the rabbi has declared the last question. I just wanna thank you all for being an attentive audience today. And um, as you can see, it uh, brought back a lot of memories for me to uh, go through my 30 year career ever since mm -hmm. uh, Donna brought this up. Um, I've been thinking about it and trying to come up with some stories that might be interesting to you all. And as Sue pointed out, I forgot a very important one. And that was uh, our relationship with the Goldbergs and that, that first Jewish uh, Thanksgiving. Because that over the years, as I pointed out with the guy uh, at the various ceremonies, uh, was a, a very notable thing to us to go to whether it's a person's house and saying some very uh, Christian-oriented grace or a Navy ceremony with a very Christian-oriented benediction. So once again, thank you very much, folks, and uh, uh, I hope you have a great day and stay safe. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to uh, thank you again, Captain, retired Captain George Manassi. I got to make sure I have that correct. Uh, next time, I better make sure before I even use a rank on that. I did want to 